Welcome to the verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Romans. We begin chapter 9 today. Paul will begin this chapter with a personal message, what he calls, for the sake of my people. He is specifically speaking about the people of Israel. But the message is relevant to all of us because he is defining who is a child of God. In the last chapter, chapter 8, Paul stated that only those that are led by the Spirit, those that are led by the Spirit, are children of God. Likewise, in the book of John, all who believed in him, Christ, and accepted him, Christ, they are given the right to become children of God. Back in chapter 5 in the book of Romans, we, meaning everyone, Jew and Gentile, have been justified. How? By faith. And therefore, we have peace, meaning we have a restored fellowship with Father God. So it is only through faith in and through Christ Jesus that you and I become children of God. Again, as we saw in chapter 8, when we, when we are justified by faith and we receive God's Spirit, how? Through Christ, we are then adopted as children of God. And then, and only then, we can call upon Father God in fellowship as Abba, Father. So, why is Paul's heart breaking about his people, the Jewish people? Because most of the Jewish folks pridefully believed they were already children of God. They had no need, no interest. They ignored and rejected Christ Jesus. And you know what? In many ways, in many places, that's true today. Even professing Christians and some church denominations are denying Christ. Statistically, um, Christians are the most prevalent religion in the United States. A recent survey reported that 63% of all Americans identified as Christian, and 73% believe there is a heaven. And yes, indeed, the vast majority of those folks believed they are going there. But when you ask them why, the most popular answer is, because I'm good. It had nothing to do with Christ. And like the Jews of Paul's day, those folks believe they are children of God just because of their performance or, in many cases, because of their birthright. So Paul's point is, then and now, sadly, folks have no, many folks have no real faith in Christ. They believe more in themselves. They believe they're a child of God because their parents were Christian, or because they were baptized, or because they attend church, or simply because they're good enough. There's no need for Christ. There's no need for forgiveness. There's no need for change. There's no need for a relationship, a true relationship, fellowship with God. So this was where the majority of the Jewish people were in their belief. Because of their birthright, they felt they were better than everyone else. They were good enough. So Paul is beginning in verse 1, pleading with his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters that sadly that is not true. And he's pleading with folks today. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people. Paul is saying, I would give up my own eternal salvation just to change your attitude so you can be saved. Those are my own race, he says, the people of Israel. Now next Paul says that, we, that the Jews have no excuse because they had God's word, his prophets, and the Messiah himself. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory. The covenants, the word of God. They received the law, the word of God. The temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the, the patriarchs. 
and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah himself, who is God over all, forever praised, he says. Amen. Paul's point is simple. All of Scripture, the Old Testament, points to Christ as the Messiah. Now he goes on. It is not as though God's word had failed. No, for not all who descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all from Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offsprings will be reckoned. The first attest that God's word, his promises, will come to pass. It will not fail. He's also saying just because a person was born into the family of Israel does not mean they inherit the promises made to Abraham. It does not make you a child of God. Physical birth alone does not make you a child of God. Being born in a Christian home does not make you an automatic, quote-unquote, Christian or child of God. It is not the physical birth, he's saying, but this spiritual rebirth that is preceded by faith only in Christ. And Paul brings up this interesting example of Isaac, the second son of Abraham. He was not the first son. The firstborn did not inherit the blessing from his father Abraham. Why? Because he rejected God. Paul explains, In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Children of the promise. That are those those children that are spiritually reborn. They have a heart that is chosen to follow God rather than reject God. Paul will give another example of where physical birthright did not determine who is a child of God. For this was how the promise was stated. He's talking about Genesis 18, 10. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father uh, Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told in Genesis 25, 23, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written in Malachi 1, 2, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Let's try to unpack that. Esau and Jacob were the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Esau was the elder, the firstborn. But God knew in advance the paths that these two boys would take on their own free will, what path they would choose. God loved both boys equally at that point, but he did not love sin. The word, the key word here is understanding these words. The word for love is agape. It means God sacrifice, God gave. The word for hate here is also translated disregarded, meaning that God withheld. He didn't, he did not give. He rejected the gift. So God gave Jacob the privilege to become the child of God, but he did not give that same gift to Esau. Why? Because Esau chose to constantly reject God. He was full of pride, full of jealousy, bitterness, and had murder in his heart. He swore to kill his brother Jacob. Even though Esau was the firstborn by Jewish law, he was to receive the father's birthright. But God used the mother to prevent Esau from becoming the future father of the Jewish people. Instead, that inheritance went to the quote-unquote, child with the heart, who became the child of God, it went to the second child, Jacob. And he became the heir, and his 12 sons became the tribes of Israel. Esau's sons became the Edomites, which were the long-time 
enemy of Israel. Both had an equal free will. Both were equally loved. But one chose to reject God. And God hated that rejection, that sin, and did not give him the child of God. Privilege. It was not adopted. Where Jacob had a free will and chose God. And he was adopted as a son of God. So Paul asked this rhetorical question. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? In other words, should he have rewarded Esau and given him equal treatment? Paul answers his own question, not at all. For he says, he says to Moses in uh, Exodus 33, 19, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I shall have compassion. God is a loving God, and he is full of both compassion and mercy. And God, and God does not, did not curse anyone. God does not curse anyone. And he does not judge anyone unfairly. But Paul is reminding us he's also a God of justice. And he holds each of us accountable for our decisions, just like Esau. We'll stop there. We're at the halfway point of chapter 9 and finish up next week. Until then, may God bless you and bless your family with both his grace and his peace. Aloha.